Welcome to Face Toward Zion. For the week of January 18th through the 24th, the Come Follow Me curricula discusses Doctrine and Covenants sections 3 through 5 and is titled My Work Shall Go Forth. As I previously indicated, instead of paintings, I will often use photos that I have taken of church history sites. This is a picture of the home of his parents. The home of Isaac and Elizabeth Hill is across the road and down a little from the home in this photo. This photo was taken in September of 2017. A lot happened to Joseph and Emma when they lived in this home. Today we will discuss just a small portion of those things. For the three sections in this week's lesson, Otten and Caldwell gave the means titles as for Doctrine and Covenants section 3, The Lost Manuscript, for Doctrine and Covenants section 4, The Call to Labor, Joseph Smith Sr., and Doctrine and Covenants section 5, Witnesses of the Book of Mormon, Martin Harris. I gave the ends titles as My Work Shall Go Forth, Realizing Your Marvelous Work, and Being Born of the Water and of the Spirit. As the history in these sections seems to move pretty quickly, I like to understand what is happening to Joseph and Emma. To do this, I like to create timelines. This lesson really covers what happens after Joseph receives the plates until Oliver shows up to help translate. Basically what happens is after Joseph receives the plates, the persecution in Palmyra starts to intensify. Joseph has, is harassed at every turn and people are trying to take away the plates. People want to see them. People want to get rich off them, and Joseph has to be careful everywhere he goes. Once people start to realize that Joseph isn't going to show them the plates, they turn up the pressure. Joseph begins to translate the plates, but this is a learning process for Joseph. We often think that all you have to do is look through the Urim and Thummim, and the translation process is easy, but this isn't the case. There is a learning process, and Joseph begins learning line upon line, but as he is learning, the persecution becomes relentless. Joseph and Emma decide to move back to her neck of the woods and it may be better there. Her parents agree and help them get started. As they return home in December of 1827, Emma is now pregnant. Her mother and father sell them 13 and a half acres. Joseph's father-in-law wants Joseph to work hard and earn a living for his daughter. Joseph feels this urgency to translate the plates. The two aren't on the same page as far as this religion stuff is concerned. Remember, at about this time, Isaac Hill is now about 60 years old. He wanted the best for his youngest daughter, Emma. As they begin translation, initially Emma serves as a scribe, but they get Emma's brother, Reuben, who is about 17 at the time, to help. In February, Martin and Hiram come to visit. Hiram returns, but it is then that Martin takes the characters to see the learned to verify that they are Hebrew slash Egyptian. In April, Martin returns with his wife, Lucy, who is initially very supportive of Joseph. But once she learns that Joseph won't show her the plates, she turns against him. Martin takes her back to Palmyra and then returns, and in approximately two months, they translate 116 pages. We all know the story of how Martin pestered Joseph to let him take the pages home to show his wife. We know how Martin leaves and Emma has their first child, who only lives for a few hours and then is very sick herself. After three weeks, she is sufficiently recovered. Joseph returns to Palmyra to find that the pages are lost. He immediately returns to Harmony and there receives section three. The Urim and Thummim are restored to him and in October, Joseph's parents go to Harmony and visit him for three months. They return and a month later, Joseph Smith Sr. returns with Samuel and there receives section four. In March, Joseph receives section five and things are set up for Oliver to come and to begin to be a full-time scribe. This week's lesson includes a lot of the stories of Martin Harris. He was the one who took the characters to multiple learned men in universities to get an understanding of the characters in their translation. The most famous of which is Professor Charles Anton of Columbia University, which fulfilled the prophecy in Isaiah 29 about and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And it is the story of Martin Harris, who had Joseph petition the Lord three times to ask if he could take the 116 pages that had been translated to show his wife in Palmyra. 
I don't know about you, but whenever I re receive an answer from the Lord and then go back and receive the same answer a second time, I'm always hesitant to take it back a third time. I figure he may let me learn a lesson the hard way. So while once should be enough, twice will do the trick for me. The story of the lost 116 pages is pretty fascinating. There was a book that recently came out titled The Lost 116 Pages by Don Bradley. I found the book to be pretty interesting. He makes an argument in the book that while it was in fact Joseph Smith who said there were 116 pages that were lost, Joseph may have been more focused on simplicity rather than precision. Here on the screen is a t table that is from the volume 3 of the Revelations and Translations section of the Joseph Smith papers. This shows the pagination of the printer's manuscript. If you look at the column that says the page and go down until you see 116, then go across, it tells you where you are in the Book of Mormon. After 116 pages, you are at the end of the Words of Mormon, which is the exact same place in the book that the lost pages would have been taken from. It's a little coincidental that the number of lost pages was the exact same as the length of the same material in the printer's manuscript. It's probably more likely that Joseph didn't know the exact number of pages that was lost. Martin was probably not a good enough scribe to have numbered the pages. But Oliver was that good of a scribe. Since Joseph didn't know the exact number of the pages was lost, and he did know the same material took up exactly 116 pages in the manuscript, he probably just substituted simplicity for precision. So, if you ever find the lost pages, don't be surprised if there are actually more than 116 pages. I would really like to spend most of the time today on section 4 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Yes, there is great material in sections 3 and 5, but I indicated I would rather go deeply than go broad. So I'd like to spend most of my time on section 4. When I was working closely with the Aaronic Priesthood Quorums, we would all stand at the beginning of priesthood meeting and recite the fourth section of the Doctrine and Covenants. I think quorums have kind of gone away from that now, and in fact there is a new theme for the young men that is very inspired. However, I find that there is value in memorizing certain chapters slash sayings. Just to add, the scholars will use the word pericope. That word basically means a coherent set of verses that stands as a whole. For example, the Lord's Prayer. That is just seven verses in the Beatitude, but it can be very comforting to memorize this one pericope. Another would be the 23rd Psalm. In moments of despair or judgment, it is wise to repeat these phrases. They can bring comfort and insight. Such is the fourth section of the Doctrine and Covenants. I believe there's power in memorizing and repeating this section, especially for missionaries who sometimes may find that they are far from home, both physically and spiritually. There is comfort in repeating this section. I would like to provide insights into this section, but first let's repeat the entire section. Now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men. Therefore, O ye that embark in the service of God, see that you serve him with all of your heart, might, mind, and strength, that ye may stand blameless before God at the last day. Therefore, if ye have desires to serve God, ye are called to the work. For behold, the field is white already to harvest, and lo, he that thrusteth in his sickle with his might, the same layeth up in store that he perisheth not, but bringeth salvation to his soul. And faith, hope, charity, and love, with an eye single to the glory of God, qualify him for the work. Remember, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence. Ask and ye shall receive, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Amen. Section 4 begins with, Now behold, a marvelous work is about to come forth among the children of men. Now, you have to remember when this section was given. This is February 1829. The Book of Mormon as we know it had not even been begun to be translated. It won't be translated for four more months, and the organization of the church itself will not occur for over a year. Often when we use the phrase marvelous work, we go back to Isaiah chapter 29, the same chapter that talks about reading a sealed book, verse 14. 
Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. For the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and their understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Or often we think of the book titled A Marvelous Work and a Wonder by LeGrand Richards. Yes, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the coming forth of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints would definitely qualify as being a marvelous work. But as President Nelson has commented, the restoration is still continuing. We still have work to do. It's not over yet. Each of us has things in our life that are coming up. Depending on where you are in your life, it might be finishing high school or going on a mission or getting married, having a child, raising a family, fulfilling some calling, or even retiring. And the list goes on and on. Each of us has things that are marvelous to us. How would you like to magnify your calling? How would you like to make the most of whatever marvelous things that you have that's coming up in your life? If you had guidance and direction from the Spirit, wouldn't that help you to magnify this calling? This section, section 4, is about that. How do you qualify for help from the other side to fulfill whatever mar marvelous work you have to do in your life? That is why I titled this chapter as Realizing Your Marvelous Work. You are important to God. The work you have to do is important to God. Do you want to magnify that work? Well. Section 4 will tell you how to do that. And if your calling, calling happens to be going on a mission, then guess what? This section teaches you how to do that as well. So for the rest of this section, look to see how you can incorporate these things into your life. Verse 2. Therefore, O ye then embark in the service of God, see that you serve him with all of your heart, might, mind, and strength that you may stand blameless before God at the last day. From our last discussion, we are all in the service of God. For all that we do, we are in his service. So this verse is for you. Serve with all of your heart, might, mind, and strength. I once had a missionary companion who said that if we wanted more success, all we had to do was to work harder. We had to put in more hours and knock on more doors. And yes, I agree that this recipe is part of it. But in his book, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen R. Covey wrapped the first six habits around the habit of sharpen the saw. He uses the analogy of someone who's trying to cut down a tree but has a dull saw. That individual can work and work and work and still not cut down the tree. To be more effective, you have to take time to sharpen the saw. Then when you're at your peak, you'll be able to accomplish your work much more effectively. We all need to work hard but it is important to also work smart. If you happen to be working on the wrong work, you can work really, really hard and accomplish the wrong thing. You have to take time to refocus, to know what your true north is, to have your work defined. That is why sometimes you need to step back a little and determine ways you can be more effective. You need to pull God into the picture. You need to be sure you are on his team. You can do a lot more with his help than you can do on your own. Sometimes missionaries have girlfriends and their heart is not all in their work. You have to be willing to focus on the task at hand. Yes, there are times when finding your eternal companion is most important, but there are times for all seasons. And you have to take you have to make sure you are focusing on the right thing. You have to have your heart fully engaged. Once all aspects of your life are fully aligned and God is on your side, then you can serve with all of your heart, might, mind, and strength. And only then can you stand blameless before God. Verses 3 and 4. Therefore, if you have desires to serve God, you are called to the work. For behold, the field is white already to harvest, and lo, he that thrusteth in his sickle with his might, the same layeth up in store that he perisheth not, but bringeth salvation to his soul. We all have two kinds of callings, formal and informal. The formal callings are easy. Elders Quorum President, Relief Society Counselor, Primary Worker, Minister, Apostle. It really doesn't matter what the calling is. What matters is how you fulfill it. Those callings are pretty straightforward. It's the informal callings that are challenging. When you agreed to be baptized, you agreed to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and to stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places that you may be in. And once you accept the covenant of baptism, this calling does not go away. 
This means that you have to serve and also be a witness and an example. Those callings never go away. If you have desires to serve God, then you are called to this work. You can't delegate being a good example. You can't have a counselor do that for you. You have to do it yourself. Oh, and also you are always a missionary and you are always a member of an eternal family. You are called to that work. Now, I've always wondered what it means that the field is white already to harvest. Generally, it is associated with a wheat or a barley field. While they are growing, they are green, but once they mature, they turn into a golden color. You can then tell that they are ready to be harvested. But wheat is a golden color, not white. The verse says the field is white. The only field I know of that is white when it is ready to harvest is a cotton field. A cotton field is white when it is ready to harvest. But there are biblical references to fields ready to harvest. See John 4.35. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. But cotton fields are in the new world and wouldn't have existed in the old world. Again, we have to be careful how literally we take this verse. Christ isn't talking about crops that are white. It's people that we are interested in. When a person is white, it means they are worthy. They are ready to receive certain blessings. There are people who are ready and willing and waiting. We have to be able to see them. And sometimes that person is yourself. Are you ready to be harvested? Are you willing to let God prevail in your life? You may go on a proselyting mission and not baptize anyone, but that doesn't mean you are not a success. Are you ready to be harvested? In verses 5 and 6, we have the qualifications for the ministry. And faith, hope, charity, and love, with an eye signal to the glory of God, qualify him for the work. Remember, faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence. In many churches, in order to be a qualified pastor or minister, you have to go to divinity school. You have to be trained in Hebrew, Greek, or Latin. You need graduate courses in the Bible. But to qualify for the service of God, the Doctrine and Covenants says, you have to have faith, hope, charity, and love, with an eye single to the glory of God. Remember, Joseph Smith is still four months away from translating the Book of Moroni, where Mormon will discuss faith, hope, and charity. Yes, Joseph has probably had exposure to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and knows about faith, hope, and charity. But why would he put it in here if not inspired by the Spirit? I find it interesting that it includes charity and love. Here, help me out. Doesn't charity and love mean pretty much the same thing? Yet they are both listed. Why? And I guess to answer that question, we would really have to ask Joseph Smith. I really don't have the answer, and I can't find any good sources for this. My thoughts are that while they fundamentally mean the same thing, the audience of the two are a little different. I think you have charity to your fellow man, but I think you have love towards your family. Now clearly this can be debated. I think it's really the subject of the verb. This reminds me of the 45th verse in the Doctrine and Covenants section 121. It starts, Let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith. Here help me out as well. If you have charity towards all men, then isn't the household of faith a subset of all men? Why is the household of faith singled out? I think it's because the efforts are different. Sometimes it's easy to feel love for the entire world, but there are things that someone in your family does that just gets under your skin. Reminds me of the John Denver song titled, I'm Sorry, where he sings, I'm sorry for the way things are in China. I'm sorry things ain't what they used to be, but more than anything else, I'm sorry for myself because you're not here with me. In English, the words translate to the same thing. However, in Greek, there are four different words for love, and they all mean something a little different. Eros is a romantic love. That is where we get the word erotic. Philia means affectionate love. That is where we get the word Philadelphia, or the city of brotherly love. Agape means selfless, universal love. That is where we get charity. And finally, storge means a familiar love or the love felt between family members. In fact, the Greeks go even further. They use the word mania, meaning an obsessive love, or we would say a love maniac. 
The word ludus is a playful love, like the crush a junior high girl might have. And philatua means a self-love, or really it is self-respect, or how you feel about yourself. So in English, we get charity and love. They really mean something different, and the difference is the subject of the verb. Finally, remember faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence. Interestingly, if you go to the Joseph Smith Papers website, the earliest source for Doctrine and Covenants section 4 is in Revelation book 1. If you look at the Revelation book, on page 2 it has the fourth section on it. The page ends with the saying, it says, Therefore, if you have desires to serve God, you are called to the... And that is the end of the page. Now the problem is pages 3 through 10 of the Revelation book are missing. Somehow they were ripped out of the book and we don't know where they are. So we don't know how that book, the section ends. There are not any other versions of section 4 until we get to the Book of Commandments. Remember, this was printed in 1833 and then the press was destroyed. This version only has two verses. The first verse takes you to, and faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God qualify him for the work. Verse 2 says, Remember temperance, patience, dil humility, diligence, etc. Ask and ye shall receive, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Amen. So they have additional information from somewhere to finish out the section. The next we see this section is in the Doctrine and Covenants, which came out in 1835. It says, Remember faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, brother, kindness, godliness, charity, humility, diligence, which is how it reads today. Again, so why is the 1833 Book of Commandments different from the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants? And covenants. As we answer that question, let's first compare this verse to 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 5 through 7, which says, And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Compare these attributes. Both Doctrine and Covenants section 4 and 2 Peter both start with faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, but then they both have brotherly kindness and godliness, but their order is reversed. And they both have charity, but then section 4 also adds humility and diligence. Apparently, Oliver Cowdery was the scribe for this section. In Oliver Cowdery's personal copy of the 1833 Book of Commandments, Oliver crossed out the etc. in pencil and wrote the word C underneath the paragraph. It seems that when Joseph dictated the revelation, he referenced the verse in 2 Peter and Oliver just noted it with the etc. This infers that Joseph originally meant for the attributes in 2 Peter to be listed, but Oliver couldn't keep up with the dictation. When the pages were lost, the original intent was not carried through. Oliver noted the difference and ensured that the proper wording be included in the Doctrine and Covenants. Then, since the Book of Commandments included the qualifications of humility and diligence, these were included in the Doctrine and Covenants as well. So I think that is why there are differences between Section 4 and 2 Peter. Now, clearly these traits qualify you for the work, but I struggle with the list of traits needed. I struggle with the Franklin formula, where Benjamin Franklin thinks about the virtues he would like, and he lists them out as temperance, silence, order, resolution, frugality, industry, sincerity, justice, moderation, cleanliness, tranquility, chastity, and humility. Ben took these virtues and put them in a table. Today would put them in a spreadsheet, and he marked off every day if he respected that virtue that day. Yes, I think that can be helpful to focus on a quality trait, and yes, you can become a better person by such an effort. But my experience is that willpower alone is not enough. In order to develop the traits to become like Christ, it takes an endowment of the Spirit. That is why it says that we have to have a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Once you have given yourself to the Lord, then His power can transform you. And it's not a become 
a matter of becoming a good in a number of traits. It's about becoming good as a person. Then the Spirit can teach you and it will lead you where you need to go, all with integrity and full purpose of heart. Then you fully qualify for the work. The last verse. Ask and ye shall receive, knock and it shall be opened unto you. This is one of the most common admonitions in the scriptures. Often the task of seeking is also included. See in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7 and 7. Ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. And there are many more. Listed you will see a number of the references for this. But while this is a common admonition, I wonder if we really understand what it is trying to tell us. The ask part is pretty straightforward. You have to ask. Let me give a story. My sister-in-law has a fern that has been passed down from her great-grandmother. Once a fern is mature, it's pretty easy to get a new start that will grow into a new plant. One time, her son was talking about the plant and how he thought it was pretty neat and would love to have a copy of the plant. She had no idea that he valued that plant. All he had to do was ask and she would have given him a start from that plant. But since he didn't ask, she didn't assume that he wanted one and so he never got the plant. When the subject came around, all he had to do was ask and she gave him a start. So it is with us. While God does know what we want, sometimes not always in line with what we need, we still need to ask before it will be given to us. Ask and ye shall receive. Can I give another story? My wife is a type 1 diabetic and has an insulin pump. One day while family was over, it started to beat, meaning that it was low on power. To make it so it didn't disturb everyone, she quickly placed it in a safe drawer. Later, after everyone is gone, because of the bustle, she couldn't remember where she had placed it. We looked high and low. No place was spared. We resorted to prayer to find it and still couldn't find it. As our son also is diabetic, she used one of his old pumps, and we continued to search for hers. After a few months, his old pump also stopped working. She now needed a pump very, very badly. They are very expensive, and we couldn't just buy a new pump. After hours of very intense prayer, she went to bed. The next morning when she woke up, she knew where the pump was. She walked into the laundry room and opened a drawer, and there was the pump. We had looked in that drawer many times before, but there it was. Sometimes you have to search with all your heart, but seek, and ye shall find. I've often thought that there is a place in the scriptures that says if you lost your car keys, you can say a little prayer and find them. I've yet to find that place in the scriptures, even though I've looked. The Lord is always there and will help us. However, I think this scripture mainly refers to spiritual needs, although that clearly applies to physical needs as well. Sometimes when teaching a class or talking with someone, I will refer to some obscure book I've read. They will ask, how did you even know that that book exists? Where did you find that? Generally, the answer is just that I was looking for it, so I found it. So it is with spiritual things. If you have a question and need to know something, seek and ye shall find. The last piece of insights is the most often overlooked and also is the most spiritually profound. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. What does it mean to knock? If you need to ask a neighbor for something, you can call on the phone and ask. Only when you need something physically is it necessary to go over to their house. Out of courtesy, you knock. Then that lets those in the house know that someone is outside and is generally asking for admittance into the house. Generally, you are asking permission to come in. Now, spiritually, where do we want to enter? If you could enter anywhere, where would it be? You would want to knock on the gate of heaven. Scripturally, there are only two references to the gate of heaven. Genesis 28 and Helaman 3, but we won't go there. But the temple is still the, the template. The temple teaches us how to enter into the Lord's presence, and part of that process is to knock. But how do you knock on heaven's gate? Well, you first have to find it, but since this is spiritual, you won't be able to find a physical door. Search all you want, but you won't find the golden fleece or the gate. This gate is within you. It is the victory over self. So once you know where the door is, you have to learn to knock. 
Again, this is not physical. Physical, It is spiritual. To knock, it takes a converted effort of getting yourself pure, of focusing on an end and pursuing it, then to carry it out. And interestingly, you have to do this three times. I won't go any deeper, but let this be food for thought. The promise is clear. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And that is the end of section four. Is there any greater way for it to end? Do you see why I said this is something worth memorizing and pondering? Do you see why we should have this entire section ready to ponder at any time? Before I close, I would like to just point out one other verse. In this week's lesson is section 5, that is verse 14. And to none else will I grant this power, to receive this same testimony among this generation, in this the beginning of the rising up and the coming forth of my church out of the wilderness clear as the moon and fair as the sun and terrible as an army with banners. This phrase of the sun, the moon, and the army with banners and the church coming forth out of the wilderness are found in the Song of Solomon, the 105th and the 109th sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, and also in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. The 105th section is the Lord's encouragement to the saints after their expulsion from Jackson County, Missouri. The 109th section is the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple. And Revelation 12 is the vision of the woman who is interpreted to be the church. It is this symbolism, symbolism that was the foundation for the architecture of the original Nauvoo temple. And this simple symbolism is carried over to many temples today. Usually we shy away from the book of the Song of Solomon. But in chapter 6 verse 10 it says, Who is she that looketh forth as of the morning, fair as the moon? clear as the sun and terrible as an army with banners. Now the wording is a little different, but it is the same concept. I would love to spend an hour or so discussing the vision of the book of Revelation and how this applies to the Nauvoo temple and temples of today, but I will postpone this discussion due to time. But meditate a, a little on this verse and study it out. In fact, ask, search, and knock, and fascinating truths lie behind it. Ultimately, it is a again a story of the coming forth of Zion, of how we must establish these traits and this society before Christ will come. Events keep happening that are continuing to polarize the right and the left in our society. I don't believe Zion can be built on either side. We must establish the covenants of God and look to Him, and then we will be spared when the right and the left really start going after each other. We need to be clear as the moon and fair as the sun and terrible as an army with banners. I'd like to close with a conference talk from L. Tom Perry in April of 2009. He talks about the fourth section of the Doctrine and Covenants and he talks about missionary work. This is what he says. This leads me to the second scripture I want to share with you from the Doctrine and Covenants. While in verse 81 of section 88 teaches us that missionary work becomes the responsibility of each of us as soon as we have been warned. Verses 7 and 8 of section 33 teaches us to open our mouths. Verse 7 leaves no doubt in anyone's mind who's memorized section 4 of the Doctrine and Covenants that the Lord is talking to us about missionary work. Yea, verily, verily, I say unto you, that the field is white, all ready to harvest. Wherefore, thrust in your sickle, and reap with all your might, mind, and strength. Then comes the injunction three times to open our mouths. Open your mouths, and they shall be filled. And you shall be even as Nephi of old, who journeyed from Jerusalem in the wilderness. Yea, open your mouths, and speak. Spare not, and you shall be laden with sheaves upon your back, for lo, I am with you. Yea, open your mouths, and they shall be filled, saying, Repent, repent, and prepare ye for the way of the Lord, and make his path straight, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What would each of us say if we opened our mouths three times? <laughs> 